Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the EGU Sharing Geoscience Online great debate on the topic of academic meritocracy and is it a challenge to women's careers? I just want to say a few words quickly about participation. For those of you who want to ask questions during this session, please make sure that you drop your questions into the Q&A rather than the chat, because those of us who are moderating this session and the, and the questions that will follow, um, we'll only actually be taking questions from, from the Q&A. Um, so apologies to those people who drop questions into the chat. We might try and get to them, but I can't guarantee that we will. So I want to start this, this webinar uh, this afternoon by thanking you all for, for joining us and for your interest in EGU sharing geoscience online. I also want to, uh, to welcome the speakers who will be contributing and I'll say a little bit more about those in a moment. But I want to start this webinar by saying a few words about the, the motivation for this webinar and, and the topic. So I think it, it's fair to say that, that most people would acknowledge that to have a successful academic career, generally it's thought that hard work and dedication, it will bring you some form of success. But this actually assumes that everybody has equal opportunities to access and to, to be recognized to, to, to different opportunities, but also that um, those people um, who work the hardest get recognized and also um, rewarded for the contribution that they make to research. However, this is not necessarily the case. It is often shown that women researchers are at, are at a disadvantage um, in academia in particular because they lack sufficient network ties or were still unconscious gender bias, biases among those people who are assessing their, their contribution and the caliber of that individual actually have a, some form of unconscious bias. For example, I hear a lot, on, and particularly on social media recently, that there's a perception that women who have children do not have sufficient commitment to their career to progress to the highest levels. And I think this is something that is increasingly being recognized during the current pandemic, when a number of researchers have additional personal pressures. Those people who suddenly find themselves at home having to care for their children who are no longer in school, or equally, they have some form of dependent they now find themselves caring for. And I think it is generally acknowledged that um, it is usually women who end up having this increased pressure and a disproportionate pressure upon them to take on these roles, particularly in the current pandemic. And it is these kinds of factors that actually contribute to a disproportionate number of women being in higher um, ranking roles throughout academia. I wanted just to briefly re reference a recent paper published by Andrea Popp. It was actually published in 2019 where she observed that the underlying causes for women to choose choosing to leave academia at certain stages of their career, which is widely acknowledged as the leaky pipeline phenomena, is actually a major challenge for women and actually solving this problem and the contributing factors to it is not as straightforward as might initially be thought. There's definitely a need to better understand the interplay between a complex number of factors that contribute to women, a woman's career progression. And those complexities are magnified right now as a result of the current pandemic. And so there is a major concern about how we manage to reduce the loss of female talent in academia. And how do we improve the gender balance in academia so that it benefits not only science, but science, but society and the economy. So today we're going to explore some of these topics with, with our speakers. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers. I'll say a few words about each of them and then I'll move on to invite them to, to contribute to the debate. We'll start with Dr. Mary Ann Holmes. She is a sedimentologist who uses social science in her research, research to address inequality in the geosciences. She's a former director of, and co-PR 
PI of Advance Nebraska at the University of Nebraska. Advance is a National Science Foundation program in the US which aims to increase the number of women in STEM. Dr. Holmes is also past president of the Association of Women Geoscientists and co-editor of Women in the Geosciences, Practical Positive Practices Towards Parity. Our second speaker will be Dr. Matthias Nielsen. Matthias is an associate professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. He's a sociologist by training and holds a PhD in social science from Aarhus University. His research focuses on gender in science, including how gender diversity is linked to knowledge outcomes. He's currently part of the European Commission's Gendered Innovations II expert group. And Dr. Nielsen has also published widely on the topic of gender in science, including, including pieces in nature, human behavior, PNAS, e-life and research policy. Our third speaker will be Dr. Ligia Perez Cruz, who is president of the Mexican Geophysical Union. In this role, she has promoted geosciences throughout Mexico and the Americas. Dr. Perez Cruz is also director of the research vessels Justo Sierra and El Puma, sorry, Puma, as the at the National University of Mexico. She is also a She's also a researcher at the Institute of Geophysics at the University at the Mexican, sorry, at the University of Mexico. And she is focusing her work on paleo, paleo climate reconstruction, um, particularly the Shiksulub impact crater and also the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, something of particular interest to me um, as I, I've had a general interest in this for a number of years. Dr. Perez Caruz has also participated in more than 40 oceanographic expeditions, including IODP expeditions 364 and 385. So with that, I would actually like to invite the first of our speakers, Dr. Mary Ann Holmes, um, to, to talk to us um, on, on her perception of meritocracy in academia. So, Mary Ann, can I invite you to share your screen and uh, give us your views on this very interesting topic? Thank you, everyone, for putting this together and for inviting me to participate. I'm, I'm very pleased to talk about one of my favorite topics. So when, when Alberto invited me, I, I wondered what we mean by meritocracy, and Helen has given us a, a good description with which I uh, concur. I think of meritocracy as a system in which getting into and advancing in an organization is based solely upon a person's merit, which begs the question, what is merit? And I submit that it is, differs by context. So what constitutes merit in academia will be different from corporations and so on. But what all merit has in common is that an evaluation is required someone must demonstrate merit and they are demonstrating it to someone who evaluates that merit, a person or a committee or, or some group of people. So this is a human interaction. It requires uh, humans to work together. And I submit that currently no true meritocracy exists. To claim a meritocracy ignores the privileges that some of us have at birth. For example, I was born in the southern U.S. as a uh, white person, a Caucasian, and that gives me major advantages over people of color born in the same place at the same time. It ignores the role of luck, and there's actually quite a bit of research on this. Um, the first one studied almost 3,000 physicists and found that the impact of a scientist is not only dependent on their productivity, but an element of luck. So you have to run across an impactful research project in order to be an impactful scientist. Uh, Pluchino and others studied American corporations and they coined the term naive meritocracy. They said that talent is just, follows a Gaussian distribution. 
but the benefits of being in a corporation, the salary and promotion do not follow a Gaussian distribution, but more log normal distribution with the tail consisting of people with the highest salaries, but not the highest talent. Castilla and Bernard coined paradox of mer meritocracy in corporations. And this is the idea that the, they studied several American corporations and found that the more likely the corporation was to tout that it, it is, is a meritocracy, the more uneven the salary distributions between white men and women and all people of color. There's also a phenomenon known as the accumulation advantage or the Merton effect or the Matthew effect. And it was named for um, this passage in the Christian Bible, Who, whoever has will be given more. That is the rich get richer. So if we look at something like honors programs, once a person has won an award, they are more likely to win a second and a third award because their profile has been raised higher and we notice them. The opposite is also true. There's an accumulation of disadvantage. So if a person comes in second for an award one year and they come in second for an award the second year, they may have a taint of having never won this award, even though coming in second is very, very good. So there's accumulation of advantage and accumulation of disadvantage. And not least, implicit bias is inherent in all types of evaluations. So I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail. Implicit bias is the set of unconscious, it, it arises from the set of unconscious beliefs uh, that influence performance evaluations. These beliefs arise from the culture and are shared by all within that culture. So for example, we, we sometimes hear girls are not good at math. And if that's an idea that's prevalent in your culture, both men and women will share that belief. There are hundreds of studies that show gender bias in evaluations. I give you one example. Most of these studies start with some kind of made up CV, curriculum vita or resume and they are sent to academics, for example, to or corp, people in corporations to evaluate how hireable is this person. And if the name at the top is male, the person is always ranked more hireable by both men and women. The pronounceability of the last name has an impact on how we evaluate CVs. The use of a middle initial, if you can believe it, actually increases evaluation scores. And in the US, the inferred race of a first name, for example, Jamal is interpreted as African American and Greg is interpreted as Caucasian. Greg is going to get a lot more callbacks and a higher rank in evaluation if his name is over a made up CV. Marital and parenthood status, Helen uh, referred to these. If you take two CVs and one uh, of men with a men's names at the top, and one indicates the man has a uh, family, he will be ranked higher than men without children. That's called the fatherhood bonus. Women have the opposite impact. If they have some indication on the CV that uh, the woman is a mother, she's considered to be less dedicated to her work as Helen alluded to the motherhood penalty. In addition, the way we write letters, both men and women, and I was appalled to look at my own letters of recommendation after seeing these uh, studies, we write more superlatives in letters for men. We refer to their accomplishments on their CD, CV. For women, we use more personal comments. She's nice, she gets along with people and we have references to their service. And again, many studies confirm this. The last one by Kuhaley Du and co-authors um, actually studied geoscience letters of recommendation for postdoctoral positions in the US. I think this quote from the late Ben Bars, a neuroscientist at Stanford is telling. He says, shortly after I changed sex, 
A faculty member was heard to say, Bars gave a great seminar today, but then his work is so much better than his sister's. And of course, just to remind you, Bars doesn't have a sister. This was him before his sex change and after, the very same person. Uh, the Pew Research Center found that people in higher income brackets are more likely to credit wealth to hard work, whereas people in lower income brackets are more likely to see the role of luck in attaining wealth. So I submit that we do not live in a meritocracy now, but it does make us feel uncomfortable to think that luck played such a large role in our lives. Um, an American author of uh, our manual of style, E.B. White said, luck is not something you can mention in the presence of a self-made man. Another problem is we have something called the availability heuristic. So we remember difficult, challenging times in our lives, like living through this pandemic is probably burned into our memories. But when we kind of slide through and get promoted, we, we don't remember those not difficult times very much. So we remember when we struggled. And so we attribute our achievements entirely to hard work. I was musing on the privileges that I had as an aspiring scientist. I mentioned being born uh, white in the South in the US in the 1950s. I was born of college educated parents. Uh, at the time I was born, less than 6% of the women in the US had had a college education. And I was born to one of them. So parents who valued college and ensured that I got to go. They also sent me to private schools so that I could actually learn English in the South. And um, this is the lingua franca of STEM. So that gives me an advantage. I had travel, I, I could go on and on on the privileges that I, <clears throat> have experienced. But one thing that isn't a privilege for me is my gender. Aspiring male scientists will never hear, you know you cannot have children if you become a scientist. This really generates a very uh, negative atmosphere for aspiring women scientists. And I hope males will never have to hear, I will not approve your thesis unless you spend the night with me. I have seen the email in which this was written. It didn't happen to me personally. So if we want to promote a true meritocracy, we have to recognize the role of luck and privilege in our own careers. And we have to work at uh, reducing the impact of implicit biases. We should work to write more equitable letters of recommendation. There are actually gender bias detectors online we should mentor students equally in an open, fair, transparent manner, learn about bias and make sure that those people in power, male advocates and allies know about it and so they can help with the effort. Clarify criteria for hiring promotion and awards before you look at applicants and become biased towards a particular applicant. Look at department roles. Uh, Carrie Ann O'Meara showed that most uh, service roles are occupied by women in academia. This is a lifelong challenge, a career long challenge. It's not something that we'll be able to check a few boxes and change overnight. So I want to leave you with a field photo, of course, because we're geoscientists. This is uh, Chumalungma, Mount Everest from the Tibetan side. We can see meritocracy from here, but we've got a long way to go. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marianne. That was that was a, a great way to start to, to start this great debate. Um, meritocracy is clearly a, a very complex and nuanced issue. And, and there are obviously a range of issues that are that influence academic success. And but I, I, I just quickly like to get your views on just one and we can return to this after all of the speakers. Um, but I think one of the things I'm personally most interested in is this concept of implicit and unconscious bias. And this is something I work for a geological survey in the UK and increasingly where they're trying to educate people, including quite senior researchers uh, about the concept of, of unconscious bias. And a lot of people don't, they, they say, I'm not biased. I'm not prejudiced. Yeah. How do we get, 
how do we encourage people to to recognize and understand these implicit and and unconscious biases that some people that all of us have at some level when in fact they're the product of a lifetime and 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 start in childhood and and i'm quite open about the fact that that i came from quite a privileged you know caucasian background but my father was very racist and and actually i went to completely the other end of the scale but how do we educate people about those implicit biases those unconscious biases? just quickly marianne can you just give us your perspective thanks and what was most impactful to me and what I have seen be impactful for um, faculty, deans, department chairs, and so forth, are these uh, theater groups that have sprouted around the U.S. And uh, a group comes in and sort of has a play about a faculty meeting or a search committee process. And everyone sits around and sort of participates asking questions. And you see it so glaringly on display when someone says, oh, well, you know, this job requires somebody to supervise other people. And there's this unspoken thing in the room that, oh, but women can't supervise people. I mean, I, I've lived through that. So then we replay that in front of people and it's pretty glaringly obvious. So I found those are very effective. Thank you, Marianne. That, that's really interesting. And I, I, hopefully we can return to that topic in the discussion at the end of the session. Um, I'd like to move on now and, and introduce uh, Dr. Matthias Nielsen, who um, hopefully is going to give us another perspective on this topic. So Matthias, I'll hold out, hand over to you. Thank you. And can you see my screen? We can. Uh, the slides. Okay, so first of all, thanks so much to for inviting me to contribute to this important session. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of it, and I only have 10 minutes, so I'll go straight to my key points. Uh, most of the current science policy debates are about uh, about gender and the meritocracy tend to revolve around the question of unconscious bias, as Mary Ann has already given you an, an excellent introduction to. And this is, of course, a very important question. Um, but uh, to fully understand the gender inequalities at play in science, I think we also need to examine the social and organizational context that serve to amplify such gender biases. Uh, and in this presentation, I'll give three examples to demonstrate this sociological point, and two of them build on my own dissertation research on gender inequalities in academia. The idea of the meritocracy, you can say, is in the DNA of the modern university. And as part of my PhD dissertation on gender inequality in science, I interviewed 24 department heads at my university at the time, Aarhus University, which is the second largest in Denmark. And I asked them questions about recruitment and selection practices in the organization. And many of these, they described their recruitment activities as based on meritocratic principles. So we only look at qualifications. All of our researchers are hired on their merits. For us, it's all about getting the best candidate, many of them told me. And these quotes, I think, demonstrate a strong belief in the meritocracy and not only um, an, I, I believe or, or not only seeing meritocracy as an ideal that recruiters aspire to, but actually a belief in how recruitment and selection practices work at the university. And as Marianne also just touched upon, social psychological experiments remind us that strong meritocratic beliefs can be detrimental to gender inequality in organizations. And this is shown, in, I think, in a good way in Emilio Castilla and Stephen Bernard's study, experimental study, where they kind of show that performance assessments are more likely to be gender biased in organizations that explicitly pride themselves as being um, meritocratic and they explain their findings by arguing that excuse me that in context in which people are led to feel their unbiased fair objective they're more likely to behave in biased ways so there's something about this idea this belief in being objective that kind of also triggers some of these kind of blind spots related to bias so, to say. so uh, my statistical analysis of more than a thousand recruiters 
uh, for professorships at the Uni Aarhus University also raised some questions about how closely the departments at the university followed the principles of meritocracy. Um, and in the decade from 2004 to 13, about one fifth of associate and full professorships were filled through what we could call closed hirings. And that means that there were no advertisements for these positions and there was usually only one applicant for positions. And when I looked at the development over time in this period, I also saw that the use of closed hirings actually increased. And this was a period in at least the Danish context where we saw an increasing emphasis on what we could call new public management, uh, accountability and transparency. Nevertheless, this was the pattern. Um, and this uh, and, at, and this trend was not unique for Aarhus. Uh, in the period 2011 to 13, 17% 17 of all professorships in Denmark and 21% of associate professorships uh, were recruited through closed uh, recruitment procedures. And much excellent research on gender and recruitment, um, gender and recruitment suggests that informal hiring practices such as these are at high risk of reinforcing existing gender inequalities in organizations. And I also found this to be true in my study of Aarhus University. In a logistic regression model, where I, of course, adjusted for scientific field and scientific rank of applicants and the number of male and female applicants for position, I found that women's likelihood of being appointed for an associate or full professorships was 79% larger when these appointments took place in open as opposed to closed procedures. So when they're announced openly, women's chances were much higher. And um, the share of female candidates for closed hirings was particularly low at the full professor level, where just 12% of applicants for full professorships were women. And when the recruitments were opened up, um, the proportion of female applicants for these positions was 23%, so almost double. So note here again that these hirings on the closed procedures typically only have one applicant, and in this case can be seen as a form of pre-selection. So to briefly summarize this first part of my presentation, um, I think it demonstrates that women may often be at, at a disadvantage even before a formal assessment of applicants for positions is taking place. So despite the strong belief in the meritocracy among the recruiters in this case, women are not always provided with the same opportunities to even compete for the permanent positions at the university. And this problem cannot be solved solely by kind of making recruiters aware of their biases because it has more to do with their networks. So it's, some, it's more at least reflecting on the implicit biases in their network, what we could call a form of homophily, where you tend to surround yourself with people that reflect how you are yourself and that men tend to also surround themselves with other men that they see as alike in this system, so to say. So my second example here concerns another aspect of meritocracy, the standardized, the standardized bibliometric indicators that academic recruiters use to screen their local environments for talent and to identify scientific excellence. And this is, of course, an increasingly prevalent kind of instrument in identifying and uh, selecting candidates in academia. And my goal here is to demonstrate how this form of standardization, despite uh, underlying object objectives, which are often focused on making performance assessments more fair, more objective, they can also contribute to perpetuate inequalities in academic organizations. And this also happens often in implicit and unintentional ways. So my empirical sample here it concerns the Danish bibliometric research indicator, which was introduced by the Ministry of Science in 2009 as a way of allocating performance-based funding for universities. And it's based on, you may know similar approaches elsewhere, it's based on different uh, shaded counting of scholarly publications, where it makes a distinction between prestigious, high-quality journals and book publishers and normal-level publication channels. And when researchers publish in prestigious outlets, their universities will receive more indicator points for their work. And based on a stratified sample of 2,000 Danish researchers, I carried out a study that demonstrates negative gender consequences of this form of standardization. Specifically, I compared how many indicator points women and men on average received for their peer-reviewed publications over a three-year period. 
And in a regression analysis that adjusted also for scientific field and academic rank, I found that women on average received notably fewer indicator points per publication than their male colleagues. And if scientific performance, to say it simply, if that was measured by these new indicator points, instead of being measured by number of publications, the average gender gap would increase from 14 to 20 percent. So that's around a 40 percent increase in the performance gap. Um, so how then can we explain this um, kind of widening gap caused by the indicator? I think one possible explanation concerns the gender composition of the 68 field-specific committees that were appointed to identify which journals were going into the prestigious and less prestigious group in this system. Because the ministry, uh, of course, with guidance from the university, selected experts for this group. That many of them were professors. And if we look at the gender composition, 24% of them were women. And that starts raising the question about who is it that, uh, that's defining excellence in this system? Who's defining which journals, which types of outlets are seen as the most prestigious ones? And I think in this case, it demonstrates that even when we try to introduce these objective measures, sometimes we may kind of miss a view of the importance of mainstreaming gender in these cases too, because otherwise we'll end up kind of reproducing a system that's benefiting the group that is already doing well in the system. So some of the men will kind of, of course, identify the, the, the journals and the outlets that they prefer the most. And this is not necessarily only related to questions of journal impact factors and citations, because in the Danish systems, we've shown that women are cited as much as men. So that's not the issue. It's more a question about where you want to publish your work. And as a final point, let me just highlight a recent study published in Lancet, which I think does an excellent job at quantifying the negative gender consequences of placing too much emphasis on these standardized metrics of academic uh, performance. To, especially in selection processes. And this study draws on data from close to 24,000 research applications to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And the data in this study allowed the authors to compare women's success rates in two grant programs. One program with an explicit review focused on the past performance of the principal investigator, the other program with a key focus on the actual quality of the research presented in the application. And while this may not come as a big surprise to you, I think their findings are still both interesting and important. In the grant program with an explicit focus on past performance, women's likelihood of winning grants was 30% lower than men's, but when the reviewers were focusing on the content, there was no difference. So the take home message here, which I think is relevant for both funding agencies and also for academic recruiters is that this explicit focus on past performance based on these bibliometric indices will lead to indirect of gender biases. And to avoid this, evaluators should be specifically instructed to focus more on the quality of the research and less on the characteristics of the researcher. And this is especially important, I think, at the early career stages where we start to see kind of a differential kind of a process early on that will level out later on in the career. But we're losing a lot of talented people in the early stages because we employ these measures in two crude ways, I would say. So these were my points. Thank you very much, Matthias. I think that's given another a very interesting perspective on the on the problems of of the meritocracy in academia. And I found it quite interesting to to hear about the the potential role that funding agencies and 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 other organisations can take in um, changing the, the the assessment criteria, the metrics that are that are used to assess someone's contribution to the to the scientific endeavor, because I think a lot of the time the roles of the funding agencies and similar organizations are very much overlooked. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to invite our last speaker, uh, Dr. Ligia Perez Cruz, to uh, to to give her perspective on this topic. So, Ligia. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I will share my... Okay, good afternoon, first of all. Thanks very much for the invitation to participate in this debate. For the presentation, 
I will focus on those barriers for women in developing countries on the perspectives and challenges. Women scientists face challenges in developing their careers and need to overcome numerous barriers to succeed. So that meritocracy might seem to open an equalitarian system. Meritocracy system happens when equal opportunities are there for everyone to grasp. Then those with more talent and merits have more chance of succeeding. But what happened in our society with the strong inequalities where success does not depend on your capacity or dedication, merits have no value. This is the case of in many countries, particularly in the developing world. Unfortunately, we are far from having equal opportunities and we will see in the developing countries, women face overwhelming barriers. The situation is aggravated by poverty, social status, gender, and lack of opportunities. So how can girls succeed and build a career in science in these countries? That is a challenge for the academic system, scientific societies, EGU, and for all of us. My message here is that we, in the scientific societies, need to increase our efforts in reducing inequalities to advance towards a more equalitarian system. So in the next, uh, okay. Global map showed the share of women in the total number of researchers by country. And we can observe global and regional profiles pinpointing where women are more succeeds like this, like here, yeah and where they are underrepresented, like in uh, Africa and, and some countries in Latin America. About that, the Global Gender Gap Report in, 19, in 2000, 2018 predicted that children born today will be able to see gender equality in Western Europe, South Asia, as well in, as in Latin America and Caribbean within the next 61 to 70 four years. In Latin America, um, there, um, in Latin America, we have uh, many, many barriers that vary from country to country, while so also sharing common futures such honor value of female capacity and contribution in science, exclusion and insulation and traditional male career areas like science, technology, engineers, and mathematics, STEM subjects, traditional cultural perception about the role of women and absence of the role models, especially in the higher ranks of the hierarchy. In particular, a gender gap is marked in the STEM fields at all levels where women participation is low. And for example, we can notice in this graph, based on the analysis of uh, female researchers in Latin America as percentage of total researchers, that participation is increasing in some countries in Latin America and Caribbean. For example, you can, we can recognize like the participation of Argentina, Venezuela, and Brazil. Also, these countries were part of the 11 countries that devoted more than 1% of gross domestic product to higher education in the period from 1991 to 113. But in what happened in, two, in, two, in 2016, in Latin America and Caribbean, in Caribbean research and development uh, in best remains very low compared to the international average. We can see that in the region, Brazil reported the highest level of investment for 2016 that was around 1.3%, followed by Argentina, Mexico, and Costa Rica that was about 0.5%. As you notice, this is the results of a long process of political, economical, economic, social, and cultural changes. And, uh, and this figure it is notorious, and it is a pity, the, the imbalances between the number of women and men in Ade. So we can see the global proportion of women and men in science as graduate and research 
in 2018, illustrating the leaky pipe. Female researchers yeah, here continue to be underrepresented at the highest level of the professional career and persist a minority in many fields of STEAM in most countries. The underrepresentation of women in higher echelons and leadership position in academia is a complex matter that can be hardly justified by poorly meritocratic criteria is the evidence of the glass ceiling referring to an invisible barrier to advancement. The possible drivers are the combination of rigid academic structure, social and family pressure, lack of a fair playground, lack of opportunities, which include research funding, insufficient legal framework, pre-existing biases, poor protection of women rights that avoid women, women's participation in science. But how to avoid the loss of female talent in academia and promote gender equality? First, it's necessary for countries in Latin America and Caribbean and developing countries to have and rebuild the statistical numbers in order, once the problem had been identified, to move towards the implementation of and to reduce the gender gap. We need to understand the difference in different countries where the conditions where the conditions are different and, and uh, also we require to work on large scale programs and initiatives which provide the ground for developing and implementing gender policies. There are important and it is crucial that the scientific societies take the lead in those actions, revising and adapting policies for participation of women in science, uh, for women scientists. We need to create a fair playground with equal opportunities, one in which talent, capacity, merits make the difference, not the imbalances, barriers, gender biases, and lack of opportunities. Scientific societies need to increase efforts, new initiatives, more opportunities. Having this forum in the great uh, debates for the European Geosciences Sciences Union sends a positive message. This is important for the membership for the Union for Science. We need more women across the diversity that forms the scientific enterprises and sorry, and enterprise in different countries, institutions, economic capacity, economic capacities, and language barriers. Um, forcefully um, if, and effectively remove barriers, biases, role models, gender, and uh, gender attitudes. We require women scientists in committees, projects, discussion forums, uh, editorial shifts, and all aspects of the academia. We just need to be aware and be proactive, and we will succeed in breaking the, the glass ceiling and patching the leaky pipeline. I realize that uh, I realize this is not an easy task for, but it is a challenge worth undertaking. My hope is we can advance more rapidly and in constructing a fair, friendly, diverse, inclusive playground where talent, capacity, and merits count. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ligia. Um, and we're going to open the floor for questions now. Can I can I just remind people that um, we will only be taking questions from the Q and A. So for those people who've dropped questions into the chat, if you'd like to just copy your questions over to the Q and A, then we can try and pick up as many as possible in the remaining fifteen minutes. I'd like to first thank all of our speakers for the really interesting perspective they've given on this topic. Um, but I'd like to start the questioning actually with a question for Ligia because um, Ligia, you, you touched on a, on a topic that's come up frequently for me in, in recent months, um, which is the, the role that, that strong positive role models uh, can potentially have for women in academia. And, and I would just like to ask you, what, what is your view on how we encourage more women to identify themselves and recognize that they are excellent role models 
for, for other women in academia because my experience is that even some of the most senior women in academia are reluctant to, to almost take up this mantle of being a role model. So can I ask you first, Leisha, what, what is your view of how we encourage women to understand how they can um, support other women in academia through their career? Well, I think our role, or when I say our role, is the people that we have the fortune to have a good positions in the academia or relatively good position in the academia in on the on developing countries, is to try to push to the new generations to continue this kind of us. Um, to, to, to continue with this kind of science uh, objectives. And um, due to the conditions, uh, economic conditions in this, uh, in the econo economic and social conditions in our country, it's not easy because um, I think in the families, uh, the problem is in the, in the, in the, in the families. So in the academy, you should to push the students and try to change their mind in order that they can be more confident and believe in them and then can and in order that they can believe that they can do something for sciences mainly for women and also for men in these countries but i think my suggestion is to try to invite and to push the the, the girls to continue with these careers and um, try to get uh, projects for example, in my case, in the institution, I get projects and uh, I consider fellowships uh, or um, to, to support the investigation of this new generation. And I think this is possible and maybe, and sometimes it's, the results are very good. So maybe this is uh, one of the things that we can impose. And um, so in the, that the and you your question also said what can I break the role models, and this is very difficult. But we can do it in each family if we contribute, uh, and we can talk with the people and with the girls, and uh, doing our best effort to do that. Thank you, thank you very much, Ligia. Um I'm going to. Um, pass the word to my co-convener, Alberto Montanari, um, to ask the next question. Um, Alberto. Uh, a set of uh, incredibly interesting uh, questions, many of them. And uh, there, are, uh, uh, there, there was one question asking, uh, how many participants are we now? And uh, uh, we got a top of about 380, which is a good number, by the way. And the question was, uh, are you able to, to estimate the percentage distribution of genders among the, uh, across the audience? And uh, my answer to this is uh, not now. I'm not sure it is possible. And this gives to me the opportunity to ask uh, a question to Matthias, uh, a question that uh, we got from the audience. And the question is, uh, uh, the question is uh, many struggle to find uh, reliable data to make uh, basic gender analysis. And I can tell you that even in EGU, this is not easy. So what, what is your experience on, on this? Do you find an hard time finding data or what is your experience, your take? Well, um, my personal experience has been as a PhD student getting access to recruitment data and so on that that having projects to back you, so to say, like having support from the European Commission, in my case, for instance, allowed us to open doors because the resources for the university kind of were contingent on them opening up also. So that's one example of this. But I agree that it is a challenging field because universities are also a bit careful about sharing these data for, for, for reasons that they don't want to be shamed in the public debate about this. So, so it is, of course, also a question about being open towards the institution where you want these data about that this is done to help them and this is done in a meaningful way and acknowledging that this is the first step towards doing something to the problems and challenges within the organization. So I think it's a lot about framing it and selling your point of, of what you need these data for. And then I would say another practical suggestion sometime is to start to use publication data to give some sense 
of the representation within your organization and uh, at different levels and so on if you cannot get access to the actual data from the institution. That's at least, it gives some sense of uh, how much output there is and it can tell you so how much, something about the representation of, for instance, women within uh, your department and so on, or your university. Thank you, Matthias. Matthias, that, that's a really interesting point. Um, I, I want to come back to, we, have, we do actually have quite a lot of questions, so my apologies if we don't get to your question, but I, I wanted to, to pick up a question from Lillian Barraclough um, that I'd like to, uh, to direct to Marianne, because Marianne, you, you mentioned um, the experience of, of people um, who have... Um, who are transgender in this particular topic. And Lillian Barraclough Barra wants to know that, uh, she says um, meritocracy is and biased assumptions of merit hold women back in academia. But um, how do you think that um, this actually affects transgender individuals? You, you touched on this in your talk. Because when we talk more of gender diversity, it doesn't just mean um, cis women in academia. It, it's more about act, act, academics of, of all gender identities. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about um, the fact that trans individuals in academia face far more bias and challenges? And, and how do we perhaps um, have some more sensitivity to that particular issue? Thanks, Helen. And, and to the uh, questioner for bringing this up, because it is very important. And the principal uh, problem that I see is the lack of data. So how do you, so in the US we're fortunate to have a lot of data from our National Science Foundation mandated by our Congress on who gets a degree and it's a binary gender choice. So we know men and women, but we don't know anything else. And so um, just not knowing the numbers is, is one of the challenges. And uh, Ben Barr's reputation went up when he transed from female to male, but I also know scientists who have gone the other way and their um, reputation suffered as a result because they began to appear as a woman. So I think this requires more study. I think it requires more data. And um, as we try to raise the awareness about all of the biases, I think that that one should definitely be be part of the conversation. Okay, thank you. I think that's a really important topic because we talk a lot about um, inclusivity and diversity in the geosciences, but a lot of people still seem to think that relates just to a very um, simple gender conversation, but actually even that conversation is much more nuanced than, than I think a lot of people uh, acknowledge. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask um, Alberto if he'd like to uh, to pick another of the questions um, to uh, to to give to our panelists. Um, we are rapidly running out of time, so um, I think Alberto, this is probably going to be um, this will be your last question, and then we'll be wrapping up. So Alberto, okay. yeah, I have um, a question on um, pick it up uh, randomly for from the long list to Lija. And um, Lija, if you could identify, say, two most important things that need to happen in your country to make change in gender balance, what uh, your opinion is? What would uh, these uh, things be? Well, I think um, is I think this uh, this question is related with um, uh, how the government support the sciences in our country. In many Latin American countries, we have the same pro problem, and currently we don't have uh, in, we, we, they, they invest in research and technology and science is very low. So I think the first thing that we should to resolve in my country is to to the, this um, invest in science and technology in order to promote uh, the scientific activities, and I think this. It is not applied just for Mexico, applied for many countries. Because as you say, as, as I, um, as you see in the, so sorry, in the graph, the invest in the, in the research and development is less than 0.5. Uh, 
percent in the country. So I think it's, uh, we need to resolve this uh, issue uh, first of all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question, which I think is pertinent at this point in time. And I'd like to ask each of the panelists if in, in a very few words, um, if they can say how they think women can be encouraged to continue their scientific careers um, past the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, because I think this is something that's on all our minds at this point in time and we're actually doing this as a virtual great debate because we're all currently not able to meet face to face. So Marianne, can I start with you? How do you think we can best encourage women to, to continue with their academic careers beyond the current, the current pandemic? We have to improve the culture of academia. We have to make it a place where women are welcomed as much as men, we need to be treating people of all genders equally. And changing the culture is very difficult and it will take a long time. It's a bit of a long slog. But just having role models of really super successful women is not really sufficient. To me, that's not going to do it. Change the culture. Thank you. Matthias, can I ask you what your view is? Well, yeah, I, I very much agree with that point, uh, and I think it, it kind of it's an excellent question because we start to see that that COVID is perhaps kind of reinforcing some of the underlying biases in this system, and I think. Uh, an interesting example again would be we start to see journal editors. Uh, uh, observing that women are not su submitting papers for the journals at the same rates as earlier, where men are publishing more in certain fields and so on. I think it's extremely important that universities uh, take into account this situation in the coming years and start to kind of ex uh, broaden out their, their perspectives on how to support career development beyond the traditional approaches in the coming years. Yeah. Thank you. Ligia? Yeah. Uh, I think we need to recognize the bias and gender attitudes. And I agree with uh, Marianne that we need to change the culture. And also, I agree with Matthias that say that we need to involve universities in this efforts. Thank you. So I'm going to sneak in one last question. Um, uh, just tell me, for each of you, what role do you think EGU um, can play um, in, in moving us to, to a truly um, meritocracy, meritocratic, I can't even say that word today, uh, meritocratic um, environment for researchers. Um, so, Ligia, can I start with you? What role do you think EGU can play in establishing uh, meritocracy in academia? Yeah, the, as I mentioned in my presentation, that I think the, the role of, of EGU is very important to impose new projects, to, uh, to promote new projects, and to promote that, uh, put together different ideas of, um, from different researchers in different countries. And it, it, you, I think, need to continue uh, opening opportunities. I think it's a, it's a very nice and amazing association that, uh, that could help in, in this big effort. So, Matthias, I will ask you the same question. Yeah, excellent question. Again, I think uh, the, the, the potential here is to show the way in different ways. For instance, uh, start to create some court of culture, kind of culture where it's uh, relevant to share data on what's the situation in the different organizations in the field. Start to share perhaps guidelines that will be implemented. So you can kind of show the way and hope that people will follow. And universities tend also to follow each other on these issues a lot. So I think that's the way forward for you. Thank you. And Marianne, can I ask you, last but not least? <laughs> well, there are studies that show that women are underrepresented as invited speakers, as panelists, as conveners. And so to ensure that there's gender equity just by looking at the numbers, that's one way. And the other, um, I think EGU um, has partnered with AGU to create a code of ethics. And I think the code of ethics really can enhance culture in the long run. A code of ethics that 
makes sexual harassment, harassment and bullying on a par with scientific misconduct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And I think that's a, that's a really strong point to, to end with. Um, sadly, we've run out of time on this really interesting topic. Um, I'm afraid we, we have quite a large number of questions that we have not been able to get to. So my apologies to those people who've not been able to um, get their questions um, asked to our really excellent panelists today. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank all of our panelists, uh, also to um, to uh, my co-moderator, Alberto Montanari, and I'm going to ask him to say a few words in a moment, um, who is, as you know, EGU president. Um, and maybe I'll ask him in his closing words to ask it to what he thinks EGU can do um, to establish a, a meritocracy in academia. So with that, I would like to thank all of the panelists. And I'm going to hand to you, Alberto, firstly, to answer that question. A difficult question to close, but uh, I think two, two things very briefly. Networking is, uh, I believe, uh, extremely important, giving visibility to the topic. And the second thing, but it is, it is very challenging, is uh, to provide suggestions to the academia and institutions how to evaluate meritocracy. And we are discussing uh, a lot in the scientific community about this. It's challenging, but I think we need to give ideas because it's the scientific community that should be proactive in giving ideas on how to uh, assess meritocracy in an unbiased way. That's it. Thank you, Alberto. Fantastic words to end this, uh, this great debate as part of EGU Sharing Geoscience Online. 